as we're in uh, about 17 locations now, obviously you can imagine sort of one program doesn't fit um, as it would in Southern Africa versus Southeast Asia. So we, there's a fair bit of contextualization, but to give it, I guess the four pillars um, of what we do is um, uh, global campaigns. So to reach people, to reach people around the world, with various, various ways of, of, of reaching them through uh, sporting events, um, campaigns in airports and transportation, in schools, etc. cetera. Um, we run hotlines around the world. Um, hotlines are very important because they uh, procure the information that we need to, to be able to do the triage for intervention. Um, and then we also run uh, a forensics facility, mainly in Southeast Asia for children called the CAC, um, which is about collecting a really robust um, witness statement so that the, the, uh, the accused can be sentenced correctly. And, and of course, the care and the holistic care that's required for that child thereafter. Um, and in addition to that, in our aftercare piece, we, uh, we run something that we've coined the phrase a freedom center. Um, you know, in many, in many cases, uh, you know, we, over the years, we've realized that institutionalized care doesn't really work as well as um, having the focus of giving someone independence. And so a freedom center really exists in close proximity to where a victim may be uh, residing. Sometimes we prepare uh, places for them to live with their children. It'll be foster care. Uh, if they're adults, we, 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 would, we would rent them a place of their own. Um, and then they come to the Freedom Centre to learn new skills, sometimes very basic skills. And then also just really to get them back on the path uh, of independence and to give, them, to give them their life back holistically again. Got it. Hey, Christian, let me ask you a quick question. Uh, just a side note, Forensic Centre, yeah. uh, can you just share for a minute what a Forensic Centre is? Is it just merely collecting witnesses or what else do you guys do during, in this Forensic Centre? Well, I mean, it's sort of filling a gap where, you know, as a, I think it's important to say, you know, partnerships are very important in, in well, everywhere we work. Um, but it goes back to, uh, uh, you know, previously in Thailand, there weren't really many convictions um, when it came to child trafficking. And that was mainly down to the fact that the witness statements were usually incorrect or that um, um, they were, you know, children, you know, they don't necessarily remember things um, in, in perfect uniformity. You know, they need, they need special care and they need um, specially trained uh, forensic social workers to be able to take them through a process. Um, very, very often, you know, we, we experience this in Southeast Asia. And one of the reasons why we set up the CAC is because um, quite often rookie police officers were involved in collecting the witness statement and pulling it together. And quite often because you know, human trafficking was not necessarily given the priority it should, you know, you'd have multiple police officers, you know, dipping in to get information. And of course, you know, yeah, if you say the car's yellow one minute, for example, and the, but then you say the car's red, it's enough to get the whole thing, thing thrown out of court, even innocuous things like the car is red, the car is yellow. Um, so when, when we say forensics, um, we really mean, um, uh, properly obtaining um, the witness statement that can be corroborated for, um, for, the, for the prosecutor. And of course, there are other, other areas that we would get involved into, so the physicality of the child, particularly if they've been harmed in any way. Um, we will bring professionals in to do that. It's very much a collaboration with, um, um, with other organizations for those kind of forensics, but we'll collect all of that information. Um, the, the, the CAC as a model, um, works in, in collaboration with what we call ICAC, which is the Internet Crimes Against Children. So um, a traditional CAC model is that you would have a home or a facility rather, and um, in part of the facility you would have the, um, the professionals, um, which we call ICAC, as I just mentioned, who would uh, disseminate the information and they would be on hand for specific cases. And then the other part would be um, the, the holistic care for the child, there'd be the interview room, which is very important. Um, we don't want to have to ask questions over and over again. So we have technology in the interview room, we'll have cameras, we'll have audio, um, but we make it as comfortable for the child as possible, um, as well as um, listing and identified all of the holistic care that, that child will need. 
You got it. Bethany, I'm going to loop you in as well, too. And you and I have gotten to know each other for many years now. Share a little bit about your story, whether it's for with IJM and formerly with the State Department. Yeah, so I started working on the issue of human trafficking um, really when I was in graduate school, um, about 2002, February 2002. I had no idea that it existed until I saw a poster that a woman from the Salvation Army had put up in a hallway in my graduate school cafeteria. And it was just, it took me aback and I put my name down on the mailing list and asked her, what is this? What do I do? Um, and I just started to receive information. Um, <laughs> I was thinking little by little, but it was actually more like a flood. It felt like a flood of information in my inbox. And I remember I would go to the computer lab each day to check my email. This was you know, early 2002, so there wasn't a lot of internet in our dorms or other places. And so I'd go to the computer lab, log in, and I'd get this um, a flood of new information from this woman, um, just collecting stories from all around the world of people who are being um, bought and sold. Um, women, little girls, boys, families um, taken into labor trafficking. And um, I, it really, I, I just remember hanging my head in my hands, just not knowing what it could possibly do and wondering how can this be real? How did I never know about this before? How can there be so many cases of this happening around the world? And I'm only at the age of what, I think 23 back then, just now figuring, finding out about this. And it's completely overwhelming. And it's really some of the darkest things I had ever heard or seen in my life. Um, so my first encounter with human trafficking was, um, it was, it, it, it grabbed a hold of my imagination. I knew I wanted to do something, but I also felt completely paralyzed. Um, I just felt like there was nothing I possibly could do. But that flood of information really uh, started to help guide me and um, helped me realize that this was something I wanted to know what to do about. And it really came through a connection with others. I, I learned that when you start to connect with other people who are willing to also learn and to acknowledge what they don't know, um, but figure out together um, how to know more and how to move forward and how to take action, um, uh, things start to change. And so for me, it started by um, beginning to work with an organization called the International Justice Mission. Um, and along the way, actually through my work with IJM, I met a woman named Christine Kane. And um, she, when I met her, was in the early stages of founding this organization called um, the A21 Campaign. And it, and that connection with her really became a, a really significant encouragement to me um, to to want to stay in this fight over the long haul. To realize that you know we're going to take on a really giant evil in the world. There's there's I can't think of any uh, the, <laughs> you the darkness of trafficking can't be over dramatized. It cannot be. Um, we, it can't be, um, it, it can, it can honestly be really crushing. And there have been so many times over the years where when you really start to understand what trafficking is, you want to figure out something else to work on instead. <laughs> um, and, um, and it was, it's friendships, particularly like that with Christine Kane and watching what she's done to mobilize A21 into, uh, into the world that has shown me that uh, when we are connected with others, we can, we can move forward. And when we actually need to be in this over the long haul, because traffickers are, um, <laughs> They're really innovative. They're using things like the COVID-19 pandemic to profit even more from trafficking. And they're gonna figure out how to stay in this over the long haul, how to keep profiting as much as they possibly can over the purchase of human beings and using them as commodities and using them over and over and over and over again until they just discard them. So traffickers are committed and I'm, I want to see us be at least as committed, um, all the more committed. And but we actually, what we need to, to do it in community um, together. So, IJM um, in the early earlier days, um, 
getting to know A21, um, I continued in this work with IJM for nearly 15 years. And then um, I went to work for the United States Department of State. And the US Department of State has an office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. And it's, um, it's the highest federal authority in the United States in regard to human trafficking and the United States engagement with every country in the world in regard to what they're doing um, to fight human trafficking. And um, I served for a while with the State Department and it was just incredibly eye-opening to get a view into this issue truly from a global perspective um, and to see just how much progress actually has been made. Um, the United States um, opened this office at the State Department in 2000. So um, really this, this issue is new for uh, on the world stage as a whole, including for our own country. But we put, we've had 20 years now in this movement and there's been an incredible amount of progress. But at the same time, we're at the beginning. This is still the very beginning and there's, a lot ahead of us and I'm really excited about the possibilities ahead, especially after um, this season of having worked with the State Department and um, seeing what's been done and what's left to do, but also seeing just the incredible organizations that have risen up and have dedicated themselves um, to being in this fight for the long haul. Thank you, Bethany. Christian, let me bring you into the conversation. Share a little bit about your journey in this fight against trafficking and also a little bit tie in with the I, Can You See Me campaign that you started as well, too. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the short story is, I mean, I feel like Bethany, I was just horrified with the things that I, I discovered knowing that nobody really knew about this. And that was back in 2004, 2005, um, which, uh, which, which led me to uh, work with some great people to start an organization, sorry, not an organization, a campaign called Stop the Traffic. And uh, that kind of, you know, I knew nothing about it. I mean, I just knew I needed to do something. And I sort of, you know, speaking about trafficking was like speaking into an echo chamber because it just really, really just people didn't believe it to be true. You know, and it was, we're talking, we're talking staggering amounts of people. And, and I was just thought, you're horrified. How, how could we not, how could people not know about this? And so, you know, that campaign was, was amazing in that we got, you know, pre-Facebook, which is, I think, really impressive, a couple of million signatures. It put trafficking on some kind of agenda within the UN um, and in within the British government as well, which meant that uh, more priority was given to it. It was given a bit of a platform. And that was on the, the 200th, uh, the bicentenary of the um, abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, which was spearheaded by... Wilberforce so there was quite a lot of you know a lot of a lot of news about it and so we were able to sort of piggyback off the back of that and then I you know when that all settled down I sort of thought why well, I, I really need to understand what's what the what the mechanics of this this are and so so I started um, my own little agency you know we we did some we did some missions actually I was doing some work in Burma in particular with the Shan state and different things and working with the Thai government and um, you know, went on to do a little stint with Love One Forty Six. They're great, great guys, great allies of ours. And um, and then A Twenty One. So, <laughs> I mean, it's just been a tremendous kind of journey of just seeing, honestly, seeing milestone after milestone uh, combated. Where you know, in the early stages, we just thought, well, how the heck are we going to make a dent in this? How are we going to make it? Well, how are we going to do anything of, of any use? Um, but yeah. It's, it's a long old story, but uh, that's the basics of it. Tommy. Got it. Christian, let me, uh, I'm gonna follow up uh, with Bethany on this, but let me ask you a follow-up question for you is, when we think of uh, traffic, a lot of people think of sexual trafficking, everything like that. The term yeah. human trafficking involves a lot more. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that involves in the whole idea of human trafficking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, most people will think of human trafficking as sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. Or someone who's being you know forced into prostitution and uh you know it's still uh, one of the largest forms of trafficking um but really it's 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 a it's a way in which somebody has been uh, either coerced or forced to do something against their will and that could include sex trafficking it could include labor trafficking it could be domestic servitude um it could be uh, online enticement in fact there are many many different uh 
uh, categories of trafficking. Um, but the main ones are labor trafficking, sex trafficking, domestic servitude, um, online enticement. Um, and, 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 you, so they, and they take on many forms. Many of the, the approaches that traffickers use um, are similar in that it usually involves coercing a person. Uh, it usually involves them being lured into something that they think uh, is one thing. And then when they're within the situation where they are now powerless, um, are forced to do something that is, 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 is against their will. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the basic definition is there. Yeah, and for some of you guys who are new to this conversation, is our mutual friend, Christian and Bethany and mine is Bill Clark, and Bill invited me on a trip to Asia, brought some of our folks from Jakarta to join me, and, the one, and we met in Thailand and Cambodia, and the one thing that really struck me, because I have a one-year-old daughter, I have a six-year-old daughter, he's a very fact that in Thailand, they sell their babies that they pass those babies around, drug the baby, and then they beg for money using the baby as bait. And that really captivated me because I'm sitting there, how in the world does someone allow that to happen just because I have a one-year-old daughter at home or a six-year-old daughter? Yeah. So, hey, Bethany, you mentioned in your introduction that progress has been made. Talk a little bit about some of that progress that you've seen. Yeah. And actually, I was going to piggyback on yeah. what Christian was talking about for a minute, too, with the definition. It's just that throw out some numbers. Um, statistics can be really unhelpful <laughs> because they're, um, they're nebulous, but I, they're also, um, it's, they're still important. And so I'll throw out one, and that's that um, the estimate, the current estimate right now is that there are about 24.9 million people who are victims of human trafficking in the world. And that comes from the International Labor Organization. And just to piggyback on what Christian was saying, to break that down, um, there are over 16 million out of that 24.9 who are victims of labor trafficking specifically. Um, so this is forced labor. Um, you can have anything, anything from individuals, children, like what you were just talking about, um, Tommy, with forced child begging. You can have entire families that are um, in servitude to a slave master um, for labor and um, that that's the largest category of human trafficking victims. But like Christian said, often a lot, a lot of times what we think of when we think of human trafficking is sex trafficking. And um, it's a little bit over 4 million people in the world are victims of sex trafficking. And certainly we think of uh, women and girls, it also affects boys. Um, and it's when um, uh, bodies are really truly just like with forced labor um they're used as a commodity to be sold for sex um, and to be exploited commercially um to for traffickers and um uh brothel keepers or who are also technically traffickers anyone who is taking a human body and use it exploiting it and using it and making profit off of it and uh, that is the definition definition of trafficking and there's no movement required either there doesn't have to be crossing borders for it to be trafficking in some ways trafficking is a bit of a, a misnomer for this crime the trafficking can happen in in someone's home. Um, it can happen when a parent, there are a large percentage of kids who are being exploited online who are actually being exploited by their parents. The parents are the traffickers. Um, and then, but that other 4 million um, is actually a category um, called state, state sanctioned um, uh, trafficking. And state sanctioned trafficking is when a government is actually the trafficker. And uh, this is something that has come into um, much greater focus, really even in just this past year. Um, the United States State Department, when uh, they put out their 2020 Trafficking in Persons report, they identified 10 countries um, around the world that where the government itself is not only condoning <laughs> trafficking, but is, is actually even also participating, that they themselves are profiting from the um, abuse and exploitation and um, forced labor and sexual exploitation of their own citizens or people who are um, in their within their own borders. And so I just think that's a helpful to get a sketch of what trafficking looks like right now um, and this, this breakdowns and um, particularly wanted to highlight that issue of um, 
uh, how we're seeing governments as traffickers as well right now. But back to your other question, uh, Tommy, you wanted to, you were asking about progress. Yep, progress made. Yeah, um, I'll just highlight one thing um, just to keep the conversation um, flowing and we can bounce back and forth on this. But the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, the number of truly excellent organizations that have risen up in the, tw in the past 20 years um, and even in the past 10 years um, and, and not number and volume, but like organizations that have um, become established and have gone deep into this issue and have um, decided that they're going to stay in this. And I think right now with the pandemic in particular, we're realizing um, the vulnerability of um, nonprofit organizations. The first thing to go when um, when things got rough economically and when things were shutting down at the beginning of this pandemic was um, the first thing to go is money to fund um, nonprofit organizations. But nonprofits like A21 are on the front lines and they are the ones who are um, interfacing directly with victims of human trafficking. Um, with law enforcement, they're the ones providing care, and uh, we need to figure out how to help them stay in that, how to keep the resources and funding flowing uh, to them so that they can continue to stay over the long haul and to actually provide that really tangible service. And what I've been seeing in the realm of partnership, so is I think in some of the early days of the trafficking movement, we saw um, some competition really between organizations um, as they started to develop and everyone had their own take on how to work on this issue. And of course that's still at play to some degree, but I think more than ever we're starting to see, just like Christian was mentioning earlier, um, real partnership start to happen uh, across organizations and organizations working with um, government entities as well. And certainly, um, I think the very best anti-trafficking organizations are the ones who are working directly with um, law enforcement and um, to, uh, to, to attack the problem from the source and who are also working um, really diligently to, to train and equip um, social workers and care providers for our, um, after survivors have been rescued. And so that, I think, the just excellence of uh, people rising up and committing to stay over the long haul and committing to work on it together to find solutions um, rather than in silos. That, that's a huge sign of progress. You got it, Bethy. Hey, Christian, let me ask you a quick question. She mentioned a lot of times when people think of human trafficking, immediately your mind goes to somewhere like Asia, where a lot of this is taking place. We see that in Cambodia. We see that in Thailand as well, too. As you travel around the world, where are some of those hot spots? Do you see a lot of those situations in the U.S.? Do you see it in Europe? Do you see it in Russia or Asia or Africa? Or is it across everywhere? What were your, some of your feedback on that? Yeah, as where do you start with that? I mean, the, the reality is it is everywhere. And I think just focusing on the US for a moment, um, um, there, there used to be this sort of notion that perhaps it isn't in the backyard, whether it be my country in the UK or the US. And I think people are beginning to realize that's actually probably not the case um, as people are becoming more aware, which is which is really powerful. Um, but but no, I mean, I, I mean, I've seen I've seen some horrendous. We as A twenty one have seen some horrendous cases in in uh, in the U S. Um, uh, in the U K. Um, it's been it's been predominantly for many many years. It's been hidden, and it's only through um, uh, the 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 work of NGOs and actually some, some some of the government agencies that people are beginning to to see this now. They're beginning to be aware that perhaps what is hidden is in fact in plain sight, a, 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 a phrase that we use a lot now. And I think, um, and, because, and because people are starting to see it, they're starting to see things in their own community and their own neighborhoods. And I think, you know, everyone has this sort of innate sense of suspicion um, that when something isn't right, if you see something and it just doesn't feel right, chances are it isn't. And I think that the shift has been, um, through through all of the activities of NGOs around the world um, to to create awareness is that people are actually tapping into that 
well, that doesn't look right in my community. That lady who brings out the trash once a week in New York, um, in my apartment, doesn't look happy. Something's not right there. I only see her when she brings out the trash. Oh, and then the other day she had a black eye. The kind of things that perhaps you may turn a blind eye to, but that, you know, very, very often you see domestic servitude, you know, right on your doorstep. It doesn't matter where you are. And um, I, you know, we have seen a massive increase in, in calls and reports from everyday people who have just got an inkling that something's not right and, and are seeing it in the neighborhood. And it's not Asia, and but yes, it is in Asia, but it's not just those countries. It's literally everywhere. I don't think there is a, I mean, someone told me Iceland, Iceland, they haven't had any cases, but I mean, <laughs> I don't even know if that's true, but I, I, we've seen it everywhere, literally everywhere. Got it. Hey, Bethany, a question came in from someone as a follow up. They said, you mentioned that some people are profiting during COVID-19. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I'll just get back to that. Just the core point that traffickers are, um, they're innovative. Uh, unfortunately, they are constantly trying to figure out how to maximize their profit and how to make the most out of any given situation and um, to, to go after people and exploit them. And in COVID-19 um, with uh, many, uh, so many children uh, learning at home, I'd love to hear Christian talk to this because I know that Christians um, in A21 have been partnering really closely on this issue in particular, but um, data still has to be uh, verified over time. The pandemic is still relatively new, but um, it's quite clear that there is a, a real surge in the amount of um, uh, uh, videos and images that are being put online of children and of children being exploited um, directly. Um, it, it was already happening before the pandemic, but it, a direct increase during the pandemic. And there's just a, an incredible vulnerability to children who are no longer able to be in school or have the attention or to be seen by their teachers and administrators who care for them and see them. And they live in vulnerable homes and their homes already weren't safe. And now they are only at home and they're vulnerable, like I said before, about um, parents and family members or close friends of family who are in far number far greater numbers than we would ever like to admit who are themselves the traffickers, but also predators who are coming in through gaming platforms or social media who are seeking out children who are vulnerable. And uh, we're just seeing a, a real, a very significant surge in this problem. Uh, I'll turn it over to Christian. Yeah, really, really good point. I mean, we've, um, well, two things on that off, off the back of what Bethany's just said. I mean, you know, we, you know, we used to think of the playground um, mm. as a place where we should protect our, our kids, a physical place, but really the digital playground is the battlefield now. Mm. And, um, and, to, and to illustrate that, there, were, there are so many things we could talk about, but we, we produced a video that people can, can watch actually on uh, uh, a21.org forward slash can you see me. If you click on the US and then click on online enticement, you'll get the video there where you can, you can watch it where we've recreated a story but in, in essence uh, that's that story was a true story it was a, it was um it was actually a 12 year old boy and um he'd been uh gaming o o online met a friend and uh that he thought was a 13 year old girl and uh, turned out to be a, a 40 year old man and to cut a long story short they uh you know within a game you have these privileges and hacks where you can get to the next level right and um so the friend uh, who is, a, is, is, is actually enticing this little boy uh, said, look, I'll give you a cheat and hack to get to the next level. Just take your top off. Something fairly innocuous. Of course, 12-year-old brain thinks, oh, okay, I can, I can do that. Takes his clothes off, uh, his top off, gets the cheat and hack. You know where I'm going with this. Well, I'll give you the next cheat and hack, but can you take your trousers off and your, and your, and your, your underwear, which he then does. And it gets, es escalates to the point where it becomes indecent really indecent and in this case this little boy was told by um this this uh, perpetrator to get his little sister in the room who was eight years old undress her and perform sexual acts on her he said no um and then the perpetrator revealed himself showed all the images that he had collected of him and said if you don't do it 
and Gary to put it on social media and, and your family are going to find out. So he's enlisting control over this little boy. The little boy jumped off the balcony and killed himself. And that was the reality, right? And then when the police followed the line of inquiry, that perpetrator, um, it was actually two accomplices, both in their 40s. They had done this to 175 other little children in the UK. And here's the, here's the thing. When the police knocked on the door of all the parents to, to, uh, to, you know, to, to tell them, none of the parents knew. So the work that these people do to our kids on the digital battlefield, the playground, is unbelievable. The way that they can entice these kids, coerce them to silence, and then abuse them uh, perpetually. Now, to your point about COVID and the lockdown, etc. of course, <laughs> young kids were online before, but as Bethany said, they're all online all the time now. And, uh, and so are the perpetrators. And... Um, uh, to, to, we don't, as Bethany said, we don't have uh, all the, the full picture yet, but just some evidence of, um, of the increase would be, I guess, ICAC you would normally have, and I, don't quote me on these numbers, but roughly they have about 1,600 to 2,000 cases per year. Up to this point in time, they have over 6,000 cases that all relate to these kind of incidences. And um, the hotline, Nick Mick, the National Center for Missing Experience, and exploited children in the US. Their calls went up by 90%. We're yet to see what that leads to. Um, but anyway, it gives you a bit of a picture. You know, we're dealing with a, with, a, with, a, with a battlefield that really needs some strong attention. And it needs strong attention, not only from parents and teachers um, to put greater controls and measures in place to protect their children, but we also need to, to, to get, you get on side with the children, be a voice, be people that, that they can trust and, and tell them what's happening to prevent it, prevent it from happening in the first place. Not to mention, big tech uh, needs to be getting involved in this. And it doesn't help when you've got sort of issues in, in the Euro European Union where we're trying to block privacy and in doing so are blocking all attempts of like photo DNA and hashtags are being stopped in, in Europe. I'm hoping that we, we managed to intercept this with the work of Nick Mick the National Center, but no, I mean, it's actually not, not only is it, is, it, is it getting worse, it's about to get even worse by people putting in privacy measures so that we can't uh, check to see where all these images are coming in from, what these perpetrators are doing. No, we have a very, very serious problem on our hands. Sorry about that. Uh, and Bethany, a lot of times another person wrote back to me and says, okay, I hear what Bethany is saying. I hear what Christian is saying. Wow, I'm so discouraged. Well, <laughs> is, is there hope to this? I mean, is, is there progress being made to this, especially as the digital platform continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger, or is it just completely going out of control? What, what, is, what, what is the answer to all this? You want me to answer that? <laughs> it's a yeah. tough one. It's a really tough one, right? Because um, I think there, are, there is, is a holistic approach, obviously, um, but the thing that I have found to be the most useful, I, I care about prevention more than anything. For some reason, it doesn't ha have the same gravitas as intervention. But I think prevention comes when people are educated. And I think, I, I really, really think, although it sounds discouraging, and I don't blame anyone for thinking that, um, we are taking ground. You know, we are getting materials out there. Parents are actually starting to take action. There are more calls to the hotlines than ever before all over the world. People are talking about it in schools. Kids are, are talking to each other about it. And um, yes, we have a lot, of, a lot to do, but we can't stop talking about it. We can't put a wall up that, like we used to. And by the way, it's taken a good 10 years to bring some of those walls down. And that, those walls go up because it, it's, it's hopelessness. You think there's no way in which you can attack the problem. Well, actually you can. And I think if people are aware that they make, they actually take the time to be educated, they become part of the solution by reporting. Reporting is so important, but also about teaching your children and, and, for, and for just keeping your eyes open and being part of that solution. I do, I think it's enormously hopeful. You know, if I, just on the back of the other question about, you know, advancements, if you don't mind. I mean, when I went, first went to Thailand and I went into an investigation, it brought me into a room. Uh, we were doing a concert at the, the Kings. We, we were supposed to be doing a concert. It didn't happen. Um, and they brought me into an investigation. And um, 
six police officers were, were sitting around the table and they brought in a little five-year-old boy, a beautiful little boy, and they made him tell me his story. I didn't ask to be hear his story, but they made him recount and recall everything that happened to him. And he burst into tears. And, he, and I, I won't even say, he recounted things that are just, just mind blowing that a five-year-old boy would have to go through that kind of stuff. And um, at the time I thought, my goodness, there's no hope. <laughs> even I was like, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do this? We've got, we've got you know, kids being brought out as trophies to talk, to talk about their stories. And you know, 10 years on from that, you know, having things like the CAC where we're able to intervene and we're able to actually take care of that child. And not only us, I'm not just saying it's A21, there are other great organizations as well. You know, with, where back then, 10 years ago, there was zero, zero child trafficking convictions. Today, I can say there are hundreds, more than hundreds. There have, there have been thousands. And, and, you know, not just low ranking uh, officers or, or, or mama sons, who mama son is a person who run, runs a brothel. But we're talking about, you know, governors of entire regions being put on trial, you know, senior police officers put in jail for hundreds of years. And uh, that's 10 years. So if we can do that in 10 years, where we can actually be a true advocate for the child in Thailand and kept all over Southeast Asia, think what we can do in another 10 years if we keep pushing the education, we keep making people aware, and we keep building these facilities that are much needed to come alongside uh, law enforcement and the government. I tell you, there's an awful lot that can happen in 10 years, and I'm, I'm a testament of, of seeing that with my own eyes. Hey, Bethany and Christian, let me uh, ask, you, ask you this question. For quite some time, oh, hey, how are you? Give me one minute here. Uh, for quite some time, American Christians jumped on the overseas orphanage bandwagon, sending large amounts of money to these homes. And this person write that she saw that the abuse in orphanages in the Philippines, which were involved in human trafficking, and they weren't able to prove and do anything about these cases. Can any of you guys both talk about some of the abuse and some of the trafficking that you see in also orphanages that you guys have worked with or encountered? I can. I mean, I, I, I don't know how much detail I'm going into it, but I mean, first of all, to acknowledge the point, uh, I'm afraid it is, it is true. And uh, um, the institutionalized um, model of care is a very precarious model, one that we have um, um, done our best to avoid. That's not to say that all orphanages are bad. <laughs> some are great, some are absolutely fantastic. And they're run by amazing people with integrity and, and do a phenomenal job. Um, and, and, in, and in some cases, they are very necessary to have them. Um, we, uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is no shortage of orphanages in Southeast Asia, we have noted. And so, um, and because of the volume of them, um, I, I think this is the easiest way to get money out of people. And you have to be very vigilant when you give money yeah. to an orphanage. I've even had people in, just recently in um, Uganda, approach me to, to help their orphanage and I was a bit suspicious so I <laughs> they didn't know who I was so I said in a police officer and sure enough they were crooks and had them all arrested but you know you just have to be vigilant you have to have references you know you have to know who you're dealing with and I think we just need to be eyes wide open with anything we give money to we need to do our due diligence and um, and, and pay special attention to uh, to, to these kind of operations. But I must un uh, stress and underscore that there are some tremendous uh, orphanages. And, um, you know, we can, you know, if there is orphanages that people want to support, we know of great ones all over the world, so we'd be happy to help. Um, but yes, we must be very vigilant. Does that answer the question? I think I understood what you said. It does. And for some of you guys who are, and all, everyone out here on this call are funders as well too. Bethany, I'm not sure if you have thoughts on this one, but I think mm -hmm. as donors as well too, whether it's, uh, people of wealth, churches, in institutions, family foundations, everything like that. There is so much money that's being misspent. I, I've been to Jakarta so many different times, and there are so many different orphanages in Southeast Asia, as Christian said. But I've even encountered different people who will pay money to kids to become orphans just to get the American money. And for them, if you ask them, wait, why are you doing this? They actually will tell you, 
hey, we're doing this because we have to survive or we have to make money. And you Americans give money to these orphans and we're just telling you what you want to hear to get us money. They don't see anything wrong with it in some of those things because they said we're starving, we're struggling. And so as a result, we do all those different things to be able to do it. So we just have to be smarter with our money because many of you who are here on this call, you're on this call because you're very generous, not only with your time, but with your money, but with that, give your checks and balances. I see my friend Tamara on this thing is, I've realized that you've got to work with local, younger or local business leaders, many of them who are not dependent on your money to help them and allow them to be your checks and balances as well too. Bethy, any other thoughts before I ask you a separate question? Yeah, just to say that um, I think to work with well-established organizations that have been in this for a while and have earned credibility for the approach that they're taking to the problem that you're trying to solve and to know that the, the best organizations um, are um, they are working on the ground with other smaller organizations that they have vetted so you don't need to feel like but i don't want to um I don't, certainly there are organizations that are small and need us to give them a chance, but especially if it's in a different part of the world and you're not familiar with that country or the way the government works or how to report, um, work with a well-established organization in that um, country that is going to be um, doing the vetting themselves on these smaller partners that they're going to be working with to get their work done, um, if that makes sense. And so uh, just to make sure you're, um, I think it's always helpful for us, for us to realize the limits of our own understanding and to have a humble approach. Um, sometimes we look at these big problems of the world and we, we want to be the hero, honestly. We might not say that to ourselves, but um, often the solution that we're really looking for is like the one that makes us feel closest to the problem. Like we're really the linchpin, like we're the one who, who did it. And, um, and, Yes, there is some narcissism in that. And I think all of us can um, fall prey to that. And, um, but the, the antidote is humility and looking for, uh, for well-established partners who are also approaching this work from a posture of humility and a partnership. And um, to realize there are really limits to what any one of us can do, but to make sure we're constantly sharpening ourselves in connection with others. I think, uh, Christian, we actually have a time, but I want to squeeze in two more different questions that I want to then introduce Gary Goes to you guys is, one person right how do we and bethany or christian if you free to answer this how do we more deeply engage the business community to address the uh, uh let's see understand and address especially as we talk about supply chain and human trafficking let me read this again how do we more and deeply engage the business community to understand and address as we look at supply chain and human trafficking would you like to go first bethany as I can see if you want to jump on it. I just want to affirm what an important question this is. I, I think it is, uh, we're in some ways, I think, on a frontier um, when it comes to figuring out um, this issue of supply chains. I think for a number of years, we would say to ourselves, well, it's just, it's not really possible to trace the, the, um, the path of how a product, product was made. It's just too complicated. Um, but more than ever, I think we're at a state of realizing that so many of the products that we consume and us as some of the, you know, the wealthiest one person of the world were the ones creating the demand for these products um, and they're being truly made by people who are enslaved, people who are being exploited for their labor. And um, we need to figure out this problem. And there are governments who are starting to work on it and there are businesses who are starting to work on it, um, but there, we need a rallying cry for, for more of it um, and for um, business and uh, government partnership to work on the problem together, particularly in the countries where there are over 4 million people, like we talked about before, uh, of people who are actually being trafficked by their own government. That's the hardest nut to crack, so to speak, is um, to figure out in countries um, where the government themselves is sanctioning the state sanctioned forced labor. They're sanctioning um, the exploitation of their own people for the 
um, for making goods and products that all of us use every day. Um, we need we need to get in on that and figure out how to solve it together. Christian, I actually want to ask you two things, and in some senses, we wrap up with time. One, and I'll follow up with the follow-up question, as younger adults become increasingly passionate about social issues, what work can be done to equip these young leaders to think of innovative ways to address the issues of human trafficking? It really comes back to the point earlier. I think, I think first of all, they have to uh, spend time to educate themselves and educate the people around them because I think with education brings a greater degree of understanding of how you can be innovative. Um, there are always innovative ways in which one can use their business um, uh, in a friendly way that, that not only um, helps us intervene on behalf of others um, but prevents trafficking in the first place. But I truly believe, and I know I said this before, I think it starts with educate, education and educating themselves. Um, we, we have a section on our website, there's probably plenty of other things that uh, Bethany may, may be point people to, but a21.org forward slash education. Um, there's some helpful stuff in there. Uh, it's just a starting place. Um, as I say, you know, I think understanding what trafficking looks like you know, the, 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 the internet and, and, and media and the way of getting messaging in front of people is, is hugely useful uh, to charities. We don't, we don't necessarily have the dollar to advertise and to tell people to educate them. And I think, you know, when it comes to young leaders um, innov innovating, I think working with someone like us or IGM or other great, you know, the great charities out there who are doing good stuff, I think getting around a table and looking at the problem educating yourself is the means and the, and the way you would calculate an innovative idea. Honestly, organizations like us and AGM, IGM, we already have ideas that we want to innovate, that if we had the finances and the resources available to us, we could do it and we could, we could, we could make a huge, a, a huge difference. So I would say, yeah, step number one, take some time to educate yourself about the issue and people around you. Um, bring the ex experts who are dealing with this around the table and brainstorm um, of what you can bring uh, and how you can innovate together. Because I, you know, quite often people say to me, oh, what can I do, Christian? I don't know, because <laughs> I don't know you very well, but I would love to spend time with you and maybe we could brainstorm a specific idea that relates to your business, uh, to relate to your world and, and come up with something genius that's actually, you know, really impactful. Every time I've done that, every single time, there's always been a tremendous result. But it takes the time, it takes the effort, and we need to unpack what it is that you, you're interested yep. in, what your reach is, what you're doing, and what, and what we do, and how we can offer um, our lens into the problem. Does that sort of <laughs> half answer the question, doesn't it? It's not an easy it, one, I'm afraid. It does, Christian. And as I look at some of the people who are on this call, I recognize some of the names. Each one of you guys have certain skills. Each one of you have certain gifts that you bring or certain passions that you have been gifted in. How do you use that, especially in your jobs, whether it's in branding? Some of you guys have it. Some of you guys are running nonprofits. Some of you guys have media companies, all of that stuff. How do you use those skills to really be able to engage and do good? And so Christian, before again, before I bring in Braden Gogus in, talk a little bit about Freedom uh, Centers and then it ties in with what I want Braden to share about. Yeah, sure. Well, the, the Freedom Centers are very important. As I was saying earlier, we, we don't go for the institutionalized care model, um, but we want to get people on a, on a path of independence. And, um, and so the, the, the early idea was that we would take a facility in a city or outside of a city, let's take um, Sofia, for example, in Bulgaria, where we, where we do have one, we have another one in South Africa, and other places in Greece. Um, but we would have, a, we'd have a, a, a freedom center in a location, and within that 10 mile radius, we would have you know, key critical services identified. Um, and then the, the freedom center becomes a hub, a hub, where people can come and learn new skills, where they can be um, go through the rehabilitation process, working with, with uh, therapists, um, working and, and learning new skills, which are really important. Quite often, learning very basic skills of, of how to get through life. You know, really simple stuff that, that we that, you know we need to arm people with, and um, and the Freedom Centre would exist in a location where someone who's been intervened for or might we might be putting under a witness protection program would be living close by so there's easy access uh, to the freedom center but equally 
as part of that, they can leave and they can go home to their own place, their own solace, and um, not be continually reminded that they're a traffic victim by being around other victims of trafficking. I think the whole purpose and the whole pursuit is, is to build um, life skills, uh, to help restore them um, back to some kind of normality, They're, though they may continue to have the scars, they should be able to live and exist and, 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 and be able to produce things that all of us take for granted, um, which basically means that they have independence. And of course, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is ensuring that um, these wonderful people uh, that we call survivors are not re-trafficked. And that really is a very, very important aspect because quite often they do, they're very vulnerable to that. And so we have to be their guard and we have to be um, their right hand to, to avoid uh, such a vulnerability, uh, heaven forbid, ever happening. And, and as I say, lead them on the road to independence. You got it. Hey, with that said, we were just talking about what young people can do to really be able to engage the fight against trafficking. And Brayden, I'm going to bring you in as well, too. I know you're just coming in from spring, uh, swim practice, Brayden. You know, there he is. Hey, Brayden. Hello, how are you? Good. Hey, you know, a lot of times you were talking about creative ways that young people could really be able to fight trafficking. And this is 17 year old Braden from Indianapolis. And so he started coding and playing around with coding and developing uh, mobile games at age nine. And he really developed a love for that. And so at age 17 now, he really wanted to really address this issue of trafficking created a mobile game and is using oh. that mobile game to really be able to fund the work of the trafficking at age 21 called Solus Square. And so talk to me, Brady, about Sol Solus Square. Um, so Solus Square was a game that I had made before I like knew about A21, like as the organization, like I knew about the issue a little bit just from like my dad used to work with other companies like buy to be CGI that did, um, similar work with uh, human trafficking. And so I kind of knew about that issue, but not um, A21. And so what I have done with Saw Square, Saw Square is a, it's a card game that already existed. We're part of the like draw of the game is that you're going to be um, like you unlock decks as you play different arts, uh, artistically designed decks. And so starting on Giving Tuesday and going through, I mean, I don't really have an end date set we said for the month of December but I could leave it up as long as I need to um we've added two decks that are um basically like a21 themed that all the rest of the games in the or all the rest of the decks in the game you can can unlock without paying money but these are um donation decks basically so it's like we have a 99 cent one and a five dollar one that if you buy them, all the money will go to A21, and then you get to unlock this uh, cool design deck that um, helps people. So that is fun. Amazing. You got That's it. Awesome. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, and Brayden, just for people to know, because you're 17 years old, you're on the swim team, you have, uh, uh, you're, you have high school, you're thinking about going to college. What made you at age nine start tinkering around playing with mobile games? Uh, so like, I mean, it just felt natural, like the next thing to do, because I had always loved, uh, making games like other games, like whenever we would play board games, I'd always change the rules. Like I wanted to make it more fun or whatever, like, oh, Candyland gets old after you've played it 20 times. Let's change it and make it, uh, different. So that, that was kind of where that came from. And then that would turn into me like drawing on paper, like, pieces of lined loose leaf paper, like drawing and cutting them out to make game pieces. And so it was like, I had always been making games as long as I can remember. Um, and so it was like, I had a little iPod touch that I would play games on and I was like, oh, it, wouldn't it be cool if I could make a game that I could play on this? And so it was like, why don't I? I, I literally Google searched how to make a game. <laughs> so that was how that started. <laughs> You got it. Well, hey, guys, and you could download Solid Square. It's S-O-L-I-S-Q-U-A-R-E. That's Solid Square. And so you could download that game wherever you, uh, anywhere on your phone as well, too, in the app section. So, cool. Brayden, thank you so much. I know you're just coming back from a swim meet. Did you do well, Brayden? Yes. 
I did. <laughs> thank you very much. And Christian, Bethany, thank you so much. Hey, just uh, for me, I think a lot of times as we wrap up, well, a lot of times is 821, the whole idea of human trafficking was something I, I've known Bethany for a long time, known Bill and all that stuff. And oh yeah, human traffic is important. It wasn't until I actually went to, to Cambodia and Thailand and started seeing all of this stuff, not with just sexual trafficking, but everything that was affecting kids. And for me, that meant a lot to me. Just again, just because I have a one and a half year old daughter and a six year old daughter, I'm sitting there as a dad, I could never allow this to happen. What in the world is going on that allows individuals to do that to little kids? And we have to address it. And that's why a lot of times for me, it's been so important for me to host these events in light of the Christmas season. We're giving gifts, everything like that, especially in this COVID season. People need help. And if you are in a position to even financially give and support, I, I personally am a supporter of H21 or other like-minded organization. Let's do that to really be able to fight human trafficking as well too, because there are people out there who are not blessed like us sitting here in my nice house in front of my laptop talking about human trafficking. There are people from three-year-old to four-year-olds to five-year-olds every day being sent out to their parents to really be able to address it. And so we got to be able to help out in some way as well too. And so Bethany, Christian, I'm going to give you some last final thoughts as we wrap up. I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Bethany. Yeah, I was just thinking that, I mean, from the very beginning when I first started working on this, people have come up to me and they always want to know, like Christian said, what can I do? And they usually give a caveat of what can I do besides give money? And um, but I don't know if I've ever felt the need to say this more boldly than I do now. It really matters. Like giving of your resources matters so critically. It matters now more than ever to, to give it to the right places, to the organizations who have committed and who are have proven themselves and have proven that they're in this for the long haul, it really, really matters that we give. And it also, I think giving puts our imagination on the right um, track to, to move towards hope. Um, Cause certainly awareness, uh, awareness is so important and it can be overwhelming. Like the, um, the uh, listener who asked the question about, you know, what do we do? This is really crushing. It, it is, but there actually is incredible hope to be found in this work. And the more aware you become of the, the evil that's at work, um, there's also opportunity um, all the more to know of the good that is happening and to, to know that there really is incredible hope to get those stories in front of your eyes. And I think A21, uh, the work that Christian's doing in particular, he hasn't told you this, but he does really beautiful work. And if you go and watch some of the videos that A21 has put together that Christian has um, ideated and produced, it, it's, it will get your heart and your imagination working in the direction of hope to see what's possible. Um, because there really is just incredible um, progress and rescue happening every single day and we need more of it and the way we can do more of it is through um the commitment of resources from every every single person who is finding about this issue to give what they can and to get engaged and you'll find out quote unquote what else you can do along the way for sure but i think uh, honestly giving is an just a, a, such a critical entry point you got it christian wrap us up as we wrap up here yeah, amazing. Well, look, I mean, I'm really just echoing what you guys have already said. You're absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, but I think, you know, Brayden, my man, you're the gold standard. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is what it's all about. If people could be like you, my friend, yeah. and, uh, take the initiative and um, be super innovative. I mean, goodness me. 10 years from now, we're going to clean up, I'm telling you. So, Brayden, thank you. And just super mm -hmm. congratulations with everything you've done we certainly appreciate it but i think no better way to wrap up than to take your example of taking this initiative and uh honestly yeah. guys, if, if we can all be that innovative and care uh don't underestimate what you can do don't underestimate what you have in your hand what you have within the realm of your um your your circle of influence of, of your your skill set 
whatever you have, use what you can and uh, be innovative with it. And also reach out to us and, and others uh, who work in this space and you know, bounce ideas off, off of us and we'll gladly be there to, to meet you and to, to talk with you and, and help you through it. So yeah, I just wanna say last word, glad. Braden, thank you very much, gold standard. Let's be innovative and I think we can do an awful lot 10 years from now. Thank you. And Brayden, I, I think a lot of times I have behalf of everyone over here a lot of times is I bet you everyone here is a little bit older than you. You have a certain gift and you steward that gift well and continue yeah. to make a difference in this world. And I hope all of us here in our own sphere, in our own way, will steward that gift well. And so happy holidays. Thank you so much, Christian. Good afternoon, Bethy. Have a good morning. The rest of you have a wonderful morning and happy holidays to you. We'll talk soon.